Let's start this story at the beginning, around 180 million years ago. It's the Jurassic period, and we're not on the island of Australia anymore, but on the supercontinent of Gondwana. Giganotosaurus hunted the land and long-necked sauropods grazed on the treetops of vast forests. In these forests lived a species of tall grey trees that watched the world turn for centuries. They saw the dinosaurs come and go, as well as droughts, floods and tectonic plate shifts. But even though these trees are so ancient, they were actually only recognised and given the name Idathea hardiniana, or nightcap oak, in the year 2000 by botanist Dr Robert Koeman. Until then, they lived secretly in a small grove tucked inside the nightcap range in northern New South Wales. The nightcap oak trees are the last remaining 1% of this Gondwana-era rainforest. But the 2019-2020 bushfires tore through the forest they call home, burning 2,000 hectares and claiming more than 10% of these precious trees. In fact, there are only about 120 of them left in the wild. The nightcap oak is unfortunately just one of many endangered species of Australian flora that were devastated by the bushfires. And this is worrying, because plants are critical to Australia's biodiversity, especially for the many native animals that call them home. Last summer, about 7 billion trees were impacted by the bushfires, which also make up the homes and food supply of so many animals, including our iconic koalas. Now, while those massive bushfires are out for now, the animals aren't necessarily out of the woods until their homes and food supply is properly restored. Thankfully, scientists at the Australian Institute of Botanical Science are working on it. But before we take a closer look at that, let's look at the interesting relationship between Australia and fire. Australia, the sunburnt country. Bushfires have shaped our continent for thousands of years and made us the fire capital of the globe. And contrary to what you might think, fire actually plays an important and positive role in our ecosystem. For thousands of years, Aboriginal people have celebrated fire, using it to cook, hunt and manage the land through a practice called cultural burning. This practice involves controlled burning of the landscape in order to prevent bushfires and protect native habitats. It really is possible to fight fire with fire. This type of fire, it's integral to the survival of many native plants, just like this banksia. In fact, the chemicals found in bushfire smoke are even needed to help open the seed pods and stimulate germination. Other native plant species have these amazing fire defense mechanisms called lignotubers. Now these are solid wood masses that protect the buds and food reserves of the plant underground, allowing the plant to sprout after a fire has passed through. So that brings us to the question, if fire can be good, then what made the 2019-2020 bushfires so bad? This is Dr Brett Summerall, and he's the chief botanist at the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. And I had a chat with him to help get some answers. What factors made those 2019 and 2020 bushfires so bad? We had a really, really long period of extended drought. So rainfall levels were dramatically lower than they had been for a number of years. And that's cumulative drying, drying, drying. So the vegetation was crisp and, and just ready to burn. We've had long periods of higher average temperatures. So the conditions were just absolutely primed to burn and spread over vast areas. And then what's the role of climate change in all of that? Where does that fit in? So you've got to take into account two things. You have weather and you have climate. Whether is those day-to-day -day events that we're seeing, whether we get a rainfall events or things like that. The climate change is that long period of increasing temperature over a long period of time, and that's what we're facing. And so the conditions are more likely to allow events that we saw over the 2019-2020 summer to occur more frequently. Why is it so worrying or unusual that rainforests even burn? Well, rainforests, as the name implies, uh, should be wet, should be moist, the undergrowth would be very wet and lush. Normally you would just not expect it to burn in any way. But if things are left to dry out for long enough and the temperatures are hot enough, anything that's carbon-based, plants, whatever, will burn if the conditions are right. And that's what we saw happen. 
So are the rainforest species, they don't have the same defence mechanisms? Like what makes them so much more susceptible? A vast areas of, of Australia are adapted to fire. So the eucalypts we see around us have this nice thick bark. It can resist being burnt. With lots of those species, they'll reshoot, you get new buds being protected. But with rainforest species, generally they're very thin bark. So either the plants themselves will just die or it'll take a very, very long time for them to recover and grow back. So what's the way forward? Along with implementing Aboriginal land management practices and cutting carbon emissions, there's another way we can safeguard our endangered native plant species against extinction from bushfires. It's called seed banking, and it's being done by researchers at the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. Oh, thank you. Uh, welcome to Plant Bank. As you can see, it's a, this fabulous facility. The labs are all glass walled, so you can actually see what the scientists are doing, why they're doing it, and get a little bit of understanding of all about the actual process. So Brett, what is the Australian Plant Bank? I mean, what's the objective of this facility? So Plant Bank is a place where we can do a whole range of activities and research that's really about plants conservation. So we have the seed vault where our collectors go out around the country, bring back the seed where it's stored. And then we have a whole range of labs. It's not enough just to store the seed, you want to be able to know how to use it properly and how eventually how to grow a plant from it so that we can, at some point, get plants out of this facility, back out to the bush so that we're improving the conservation of those plants. And what does the seed collecting process actually involve? What are they doing when they're out there? They have a fabulous job where they go around the country, predominantly around New South Wales at the moment, visiting sites, particularly where there's threatened species, looking at the population, seeing what it's doing, and then go back and collect the seed very carefully document, photograph all of the details about the site, and then they bring the, the seed back here. So they've collected the seeds or the other plant material, then what happens when it comes back here to plant bank? It depends on the species of plant that they're looking at. So some of it might be just a process of cleaning up the seed, making sure there's no insects or other material in it, and then we dry it down for it to be preserved, and then it goes into the seed vault where it's stored at four degrees or minus 20. Some of the plant material may be cuttings or, or leaf material and that'll be processed to be propagated up, goes into the nursery or into tissue culture and then in some cases with some of the seed that'll go into cryopreservation and get stored for very long periods of time there. So why is doing all of this, you know, getting out there, collecting all the plant material and bringing it back to plant bank, why is it so important? It's part of the process that we need to put in place in order to conserve these species. The most critical thing is obviously to conserve the place where they grow and, and make sure that that's protected. It's also important to remember that there's a whole lot of threatening process underway. And we've got the issues of climate change, higher temperatures and drying out and drought, the impact the bushfires resulting from all of that. We also have invasive species, diseases, weeds, feral animals that are impacting the conservation of these species. So as an insurance policy, what we want to do is get out there, collect a portion of this material, have it carefully stored away, we can do the research so that we better understand that species, protect it, and then get it back out there in the wild and build up the viability of those populations. Having this plant material stored safely at the Australian Plant Bank means the next time fires threaten our endangered plant species, scientists have got the material they need to germinate the plants, grow them, and get them back out into the bush. And you can help make this vital insurance policy against the extinction of our native plant species even stronger with a donation to the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. Fight for our flora and make an impact. Go to botanicgardens.org.au slash donate to help protect our plants and our future.